Welcome to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network, a show that streams health, happiness, and hope to the kidney community. You can download all Kidney Talk shows from iTunes and find a variety of resources to help you navigate this illness at rsnhope.org. Please welcome your host, Lori Hartwell, who has lived with kidney disease since the age of two. Well, welcome to Kidney Talk. Uh, Today we're going to be discussing a a subject that I think is so important. Um, I live and die by my lab values. I mean, whenever I get my blood drawn, I can't wait to open up the file and see everything's okay. (laughs) So today we're speaking to Trisha McCarley. She's a nurse practitioner with Fresenius Medical Care, and she has over 40 years of kidney experience. So cheers to you for all the dedication you've given to people who have kidney disease. And uh, let's talk about labs, Tricia. Okay, Laurie, let's go. <laughs> I'm really excited here because uh, um, I just got my creatinine back and it was 0. 0.6. And oh. so for those of you who have a transplant, you know that 0. 0.6, you can't, it doesn't get any better than that. And uh, you do a little happy dance afterwards. So, congratulations. <laughs> so, um, so let's talk a little bit about you know why it's so important to be engaged in your lab values. Well, I think it's important because it's really our window into what's happening with you as far as your dialysis treatments, your diet, uh, things that may be affecting how you feel and how you do as far as hospitalization. So. I think, you know, when the kidneys fail, um, the body, many systems within the body are affected. And so the lab results are really the interdisciplinary team's way to monitor your status and try to coach you on your treatment plan and what's best for you. Um, what, what, what lab tests are done for uh, people who are on dialysis and, you know, how, how routine? So I'll, I'll go back to your, your first question because I really thought it was a good, good one. So most labs are done monthly. So they usually do a complete blood count or CBC. And then they also do a comprehensive metabolic profile that tells us about your protein, electrolytes, waste products. And those are done monthly. And then there's other labs that are usually done quarterly. And those are based on whether you have medications adjusted or different medications. The specific labs that uh, we'll talk about is the first one is the hemoglobin, and that is uh, uh, what is found in red blood cells. And that's a, a lab that's drawn to tell us about anemia. And anemia is commonly found in most patients with kidney failure. And, and so that one is usually done weekly in some clinics, sometimes every two weeks, but usually every week to every two weeks. Um, and drops in hemoglobin also can tell us a little bit about your fluid status. So it's, it's mostly about your anemia status, but it also can give us a window if you've got a little extra fluid on. We also draw a couple of labs. Well, I wanted to I wanted to just go back to the anemia because I am, okay. you know, I used to get two units of blood every six weeks before um, epigen or the ESAs became available. And I think it's so important that you had mentioned um, anemia with fluid status because uh, I do believe that Fresenius offers at some clinics, they have a crit line, which you can see your your anemia level all the time, which I feel is just a major breakthrough for the clinics that have that because it is directed with fluid status. So if you're super fluid overloaded, um, you're going to be more anemic. And, That's exactly right. And I mean, and so, you know, I always I always find that very perplexing of, I ask people, well, when did you draw the blood? Do you draw it at the beginning of the treatment or the end of the treatment? And I don't know what's right because the end of the treatment would allow you to have, you know, kind of a higher hematocrit, but you go out and you drink and then you have a lower hematocrit. Um, and since we're on the topic of anemia, can you maybe uh, tell a uh, people listening, what are the medications that you provide? Because I think sometimes unless you take it by mouth, you don't really understand what you're getting for that that lab value. So I think, yeah, and so just one word on the uh, uh, hemoglobin and what happens with fluid. So every extra liter of fluid or about a gallon of fluid actually lowers your hemoglobin by 0.5. So if you have two or three extra you can, instead of seeing a, uh, a hematocrit or hemoglobin of 30%, it might be 27. So that's just something to be aware of, and so it's a clue. 
And then uh, the medications that we give are the ESAs, and there's four of those uh, now. There's Epigen, Nocera, Aranesp, and Reticrit. And they all work this, you know, generally the same way. They stimulate the bone marrow to make more erythropoietin to stimulate um, or stimulate the bone marrow to make red blood cells. And that's injected. That's injected, right? That's it's injected. A dialysis. Yeah, it's injected at in the dialysis bloodline. dialysis clinic or it can be given sub-Q. Right. So patients that are home actually can give the medication to themselves if they're on peritoneal dialysis. They can just give it um, sub-Q or they can administer it in the dialysis line if they're on home hemodialysis. Then also to make red blood cells, you need iron. And when you dialyze, you actually lose red blood cells. And every time you lose a red blood cell, you lose iron. So most patients are iron deficient. It's the number one cause of a drop in hemoglobin. If you're on the same dose of the ESA and your hemoglobin drops, the number one cause of that is iron deficiency. So most patients get routine iron uh, at the dialysis unit. And that's, you can, at home patients, they can take it PO. It's, it's um, and, you know, especially peritoneal dialysis patients, it can be effective because they don't lose as many red blood cells. But most patients on hemodialysis, either home or in the center, will have to have IV infusions of iron to keep up uh, that, um, to keep their level up to make red blood cells. Well, yeah, because when you're on hemodialysis, you just lose a lot of blood. It's just yeah, impossible. You lose it. Not every to. time you dialyze, you lose a, a few know. cells, and every time you lose those cells, you lose some iron. So we got to replace that iron. Well, and I'm just such a big advocate for home, and I, I always prefer PD. Uh, you know, it's another reason there's no blood involved in PD, so you don't lose those precious little red blood yeah. cells that you need to breathe. <laughs> Um, right. So yeah, I know it's um, and you know when you when you're anemic, you feel I don't know. I feel like I just was ran through the washer machine, and came out on the other side. You don't feel very good. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, so you know, let's move to albumin because I think that you know albumin is one thing that as a patient we really have control over. Uh, right. That is our responsibility to keep that number up. <laughs> Yeah, so it's a, it, it is measured monthly, and it's an indication of your nutrition, but it also is affected by some things that are not in your control, again. Um, it can be diluted with fluid, so if you have a little extra fluid, your albumin can be low, and it's also affected by infection and inflammation. So while you may be eating good and have good nutrition, if you're inflamed, if you have a catheter in maybe that's a little bit... Uh, inflamed or you have some type of disease, uh, arthritis, your albumin actually can be lower because of that inflammation. So uh, it does generally reflect nutrition, but there are other things that also can affect it. So it's an important thing for your interdisciplinary team to look at. So if you are nutritionally taking in the right amount of protein and it's lower, then we have to start to look, is there infection or inflammation or fluid that's causing that drop? Well, it's a double-edged sword because you need a high, yeah. you need a higher albumin to prevent infection. So, um, yeah. um, but yes, it's, uh, and egg whites are your friend. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, uh, let's talk about phosphorus and calcium and SHPT, all bone mineral disease indicators, I guess, right? That would be, right. um, you know, Yeah, phosphorus. bone and mineral metabolism, we call it BMM. And those are, um, you know, the, the kidneys and the um, parathyroid glands work together to manage your bone health. And when your kidneys uh, stop functioning, then your parathyroid gland overacts. And when it starts to overact, it causes a lot of havoc in your bones. And phosphorus is also a big player in the havoc in your bones where you're losing calcium out of your bones. And phosphorus is uh, eliminated by the kidneys. So when the kids, kidneys don't work, that phosphorus level goes up. And again, that's signaling the bones to uh, get rid of calcium. So the kidneys play a big part in bone health. And so when they're not working correctly, there's havoc. And so a couple of ways that we control that is we give patients what is called phosphate binders. 
So right now, the only way to get rid of the extra phosphorus that's in your diet, it's hard to eliminate it completely. You have to take what's called a phosphate binder, and it actually binds with the phosphorus when it's in your gut or stomach so that you don't absorb it into your system. And then the second thing that's done is we treat the parathyroid gland with a couple of drugs, um, vitamin D and calcium emetics. So those two drugs work together to treat the um, gland and keep that parathyroid level down so that you keep your phosphorus levels down and also also your um, calcium remains in your bones. So well, it's kind of a complicated process. It, it but is, for the patient, it's really Im- important to know what that phosphorus level is and work really hard to keep that level down. And, you know, I think one of the things that's is worth repeating is, you know, if you take your phosphate binders an hour after you've eaten, they don't work. <laughs> right. They have to be taken right like, with your food. <laughs> exactly. They got to bind with the phosphorus. And it's, you know... Uh, it's it's sad, and we have a lot of information on our website. You can Google it, it. But there's so much hidden phosphorus in so many different things. I mean, right. it, you get bottled iced tea, which is you think is an option as a drink, and it's loaded with phosphate. Um, right. And, you know, phosphate is a preservative. So that's why it's it's good to prepare things fresh. And there's different types of phosphorus, too. So it's not... All phosphites are the same. There's organic and inorganic. The organic phosphates are absorbed at a lower level, whereas inorganics, almost all are absorbed. And what's an example of inorganic and organic? So organic would be like beans. You know, you're told not to eat them, but they're actually organic, so they're not absorbed at such a higher level. Okay. And and the ones in the can are actually kind of good because they've been sitting in the water, and then you can rinse them, right? And they're yeah. even they're even lower. Yeah. But the the inorganic would be all those additives you were talking about. Okay, I got it. Yeah, and, and what's in Diet Coke? So the ones the phosphorus made in the lab. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> But, like, animal and vegetable sources are usually the organic, and the inorganic are all the phosphate okay. additives. So, usually in food, it's not, it's not the food itself, it's the additive. Right. And they, they're they everywhere. you got to look at the little labels, and it's got all those long yeah, names Yeah, like, just you think can't. about if you have fresh fish, or if you buy fish in a box. Right. So, you're going to, if you got fresh fish... You are going to get organic phosphates, and they're about 60 to 70 percent absorbed. If you get that fish that's in a box, you know, fish sticks, then you're, you've got those phosphate additives along with your organic phosphorus. And so all the phosphate additives almost are all absorbed 80 to 100 percent. So that's the difference. There's a new, there's a new binder that's going to be coming out. It's not a, actually a new binder. There's a new treatment for phosphorus that's not a binder, and it actually doesn't have to be taken with a meal, and it actually blocks the absorption. Whereas the phosphate binders actually act, um, you know, actually bind with the phosphorus. This blocks the absorption channel. Uh, that prevents phosphorus from going into your blood. So I think it's really exciting. It should be approved here in the next couple of months. So I think it's it's one of the coolest things I've seen. So oh, I'm wow. really excited What's it called? for that What's drug. It called? Well, I don't want to say too much about okay. it. Okay, just Wonder Drug. Yeah, wonder Drug wonder where drug. I can have yeah. cheese and not feel guilty. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> we'll call it cheese again. Well, uh, it's probably not going <laughs> to allow you to have more phosphorus in your diet, but it is going to help patients who struggle with their um, phosphorus, maybe give them a different, you know, like, like when you have high blood pressure and you treat with two different medications, this may be an opportunity to treat that high phosphorus with two medications, a binder, and then one that prevents absorption. It's so wonderful to hear about, you know, new innovation coming down the pike. Um, let's move on to potassium because oh, potassium yeah. is the most important lab value, in my opinion, because it, it can kill you if you don't get right. it right. <laughs> exactly. 
So potassium is an electrolyte, um, and it's checked sometimes in people. It's checked weekly, and sometimes it's checked monthly, depending kind of on where you are and keeping your level. And so it's really important in muscle and nerve function. And so high or low levels affect the biggest muscle in your body, which is your heart. And so to your point, um, it's really critical that we watch it. So patients who do well with their potassium, usually we watch it monthly. But if you're not keeping that level in normal range, again, low or high can um, cause sudden death. So it's really important that we watch it closely. When I was 14 years old, my heart stopped from a high potassium. Right. And so it's, it's well, and I, I tell people this, it's a little gruesome, but it's basically the Dr. Kevorkian method. That's what they do. They inject a lot of potassium in critically ill people who, you know, have no hope. And it basically starts paralyzing all their muscles till it paralyzes the heart. And, right. and it's, um, it's, it's really important. I mean, I've known people who, you know, drink a glass of orange juice or, a, you know, they just, oh, it won't hurt me. Yes, it will. If you, um, you know, ingest a lot of potassium, especially if you have no kidney function, then you're really in trouble. Um, I wanted to mention, um, too, there's a potassium binder that's available now. Do you use that? Oh, yes. So I'm pretty familiar with that. Um, so it does work in patients that have, um, challenges and they take it usually they take it between dialysis treatments but it's very effective they usually just have to take it once a day and it, again it can keep those phosphorus levels down and there's several different companies that make one so it's it's a nice uh, um, medication to be able to offer to patients who have struggled with their phosphorus intake and then there's a yeah I mean it's um, you know potassium is and it's difficult because, you know, a lot of the food that we deem healthy is high in potassium. And then, you know, yeah. I was looking at the renal diet, you know, uh, and it, it's just so counterintuitive um, to what you think is healthy. So it's wonderful that there's some extra um, options. Um, and then also, yeah. I like to always Fruits stress... Fruits vegetables, if, what we tell everybody to eat, you have to really be careful. Exactly. And you can dialyze your potatoes, everybody. If you don't know you that, <laughs> you can dialyze them too. Exactly. <laughs> and there's information everywhere on that. <laughs> yep. yep. Get, the, get the potassium out. Uh, let's move to sodium because, um, uh, you know, sodium is an Im important thing because you, if, you're, if you have a high sodium, you're going to retain more fluid, right? Exactly. And sodium, the drive to eat sodium is, is in the um, addictive same area where your drive to use addictive drugs. So there's a strong drive to, like, babies are born with no, no drive for sodium, but they learn it. And that's just what we do as people. So to turn that addictive drive off for sodium, it takes a while. So letting yourself slowly decrease your amount of sodium and don't expect just to cut it off is probably the best way to go. But getting yourself on lower amounts of sodium really helps you with your fluid intake, your blood pressure control. But again, it's in the same area of your brain that you have the addiction drive. So you just have to don't expect too much of yourself. Know that it's going to take a process to get yourself where you still enjoy food without sodium. And then remember your other additives, your other herbs and spices that can take the place and really make that food probably taste even better without sodium. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Dr. Belding Scribner, who is the grandfather of um, dialysis, he created mm -hmm. the first shunt. Um, I had several discussions with him when he was alive, and he would say it takes 21 days to lose the desire for salt. Okay. And he said, I didn't know, the, I didn't know said, exactly 21, well, but that's is, good to know. <laughs> this is what he said, you know, after 21 days, um, and if you reduce the sodium, um, because it's so important, it drives, uh, you know, everything in kidney care. And one of the things that's really frustrating is, uh, you know, then you get transplanted and um, my blood pressure is low and, and, and they're like, 
eat salt and drink. And I'm like, I've been used to not drinking and not eating salt. Now it's the reverse. But it, it's so important to um, manage your sodium level or you're going to have huge weight gains. There's, It's right. impossible to not drink when you have sodium because your body's got to equalize out with fluid the sodium in your bloodstream. Is that the layman's way of, of saying how it works? Right. Yeah, it's, exactly. And you know, Doritos. I I want to go back to Doritos. Some of the, those people know that <laughs> salt is addictive. It's designed to get people to buy more. So I find that really interesting uh, that sodium is in the same class as an addictive drug. Well, I, I wouldn't say it's in the same class, but it works in the same area of the brain. Okay, same area of the brain. So, that's that's yeah, a better. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I mean, it's really imp- it's really hard to just eat one potato chip. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> you got to keep eating. And it's just hard. You can't go from eating salty potato chips and then tomorrow enjoy salt-free potato chips. It's just not going to happen. So that 21 day, I love that. Just, you know, know that you have to slowly decrease your salt intake and then, you know, replace it with some of those great herbs that are available for us. And, and Mrs. Dash is your friend. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let's move on to KT over V and URR. Uh, okay. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, yeah, I'll be happy to explain that. So the let's start with the URR. And so urea is a waste product of the breakdown of protein and amino acids and is excreted by the kidneys and urine. A urea level is drawn before and after your dialysis treatment. And the URR stands for urea reduction ratio. And it's measuring the amount of urea that is removed from your blood as a result of dialysis. And the goal for the URR is to be greater than or equal to about 65%. Another way to measure the effectiveness of your dialysis treatment is the KT over V. And so it is a calculation using your weight, your URR, your dialyzer clearance, and your dialysis time. And when you're... um, Dialyzing, you want that KT over V number to be greater than or equal to 1.2. So okay. those are, you know, targets for knowing that you're getting adequate dialysis based on a lot of research and what they've um, deemed as the goal for most patients. Well, and I always tell, um, you know, RSN members and people I come across is that, you know, it's adequate dialysis. And if you you don't feel well and, you know, we should strive for optimal dialysis. And you may need some uh, additional treatment. You may need um, uh, to be on the machine longer. Um, and that's actually a good thing <laughs> um, yeah, to and, get more you know, dialysis. We, we used to really focus on KT over V and URR, and we're trying to shift a little bit because there's other things that go into the prescription, and the big one we know right now is fluid removal. So while you may have a very high KT over V, you need extra time on the treatment because of the amount of fluid you gain in your fluid removal and trying to keep your um, your fluid removal rate down lower so that doesn't affect you. So prescription is not all about removal of waste waste products now in this day and age. It's about removal of waste products and also removal of fluid. Exactly. Um, it, it's so true. Um, mm-hmm. And I have, um, I, I know quite a few people that dialyze longer and, you know, they say they feel better. And um, I always tell people that, you know, if your treatment, if, if you don't feeling good with your treatment, you need to talk to your doctor to find a solution to make you feel better because you shouldn't feel washed out afterwards. Um, Maybe you're gaining too much fluid. You got to figure out how to work with a dietitian. Um, I know it's tough. It's not easy. Nobody wants to sit there a little bit longer, but um, you know, I really liked peritoneal because I could get up and move around. That made a big difference. Um, So uh, finding out what works for you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the lab values for transplant that you're, that the facility is drawing? 
Oh, okay. So usually the facility depends on, you know, the rate for kidney transplant right now uh, averages around the three to five years. So where? once you have your... Where? Where are you living? It's Los uh, Angeles. It's, it's, it's higher. Uh, yeah, it's well, 10 it's California. Years. It's 10 years in California. Ten but it years. is actually lower in some areas. I know, I know. I'm just I, know. Giving I lived in time. California for about 12 years, so I'm familiar <laughs> with that. And, you know, Lori, that's a really important reason to keep your eye on your labs because what happens, especially in California, and what I saw with many of my patients out there was they wouldn't. They'd be on the list. Once they got to the top, because their labs weren't controlled, they already had effect on their heart, and then they weren't able to get a transplant. So that's a really, really motivating factor for many patients is you got to keep your labs down, your weight gains down, because if you're on that transplant list, once you get to the top for, and you do that workup, um, you know, you may not be able to get a transplant based on how you've treated yourself in managing your labs and, and your fluid. Yeah. But, um, There's a saying, Tricia, if I knew I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. Oh, um, there you go. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and, and the main labs that are drawn, usually they're drawn either monthly or quarterly once you get to the top of the list so that when that kidney comes in, they'll have a fresh specimen of a blood for you. And they actually cross match. They mix your blood with the transplant kidney blood and make sure there's compatibility and so you're the person to get that kidney because you're compatible with that patient's um, kidney. So right. that's the main one that they're looking at. And, you know, how much do lab values improve after a dialysis treatment? So some improve, like the waste products and phosphorus, things that we're trying to get rid of in your blood, those will improve. If we have fluid removal, uh, maybe your hematocrit goes up, as we discussed earlier, and also your um, albumin may go up some. Those aren't really improvements. They're just, you're just seeing a different level. But most everything we try to keep in the other labs, like potassium, uh, calcium, we try to keep those in the normal range. And so you're not going to see, hopefully, much difference in pre-treatment and post-treatment. And what are some of the lab values that you will hospitalize a patient for if it's way too off? Oh, okay. So potassium, uh, depending on just your comorbidities, but potassium, you know, greater than 6, 6.5, if they're causing symptoms, you may get hospitalized. If your blood count gets really low, um, you may have to be hospitalized to get a transfusion. You may have chest pain or side effects. Um, you may need to be hospitalized if your protein level gets too low and you need to start some type of feeding, um, either intra uh, dialytic nutrition or, um, uh, inter, uh, you know, um, um, supplements. So, you know, kind of depends on the labs, but I would say mostly potassium, uh, hemoglobin. Those are the big ones that may put you in the hospital. And it's not a routine lab value, but it's one that I watch on mine is your white blood cell count. Because you have your red blood cell yeah. count that we pay a lot of attention to. But your white blood cell count tells you if you have any infection going on You're in your exactly body. Right. And that one will land you in the hospital also. <laughs> so if you have a high white count, fever, chills, those, that lab definitely. But that's not affected really by dialysis. Exactly. Right, you get but your, that is a lab that will land you in the hospital. And you get your antibiotic cocktail. Um, right, <laughs> and, exactly. Um, uh, so, you know, if you have lab values are off, and I know this is a very broad question, but, you know, what are some of the ways that uh, people can help to keep them on track? Well, I, I like to say kind of take control of your lab values. It's your actions that are affecting them, and so... It's really important for p patients to self-manage, I call it. Um, you know, they really need to take charge, focus on them. You know, if they don't understand why a certain lab value is not within the right parameter, you know, get with the dietitian, social worker, the, the nurses, figure out what they're doing wrong, and then try to adjust your behavior. Basically, I always try to get patients to make behavior change on a weekly basis, like do it for one week. And let's see how we do. Because most people can do something for one week. Um, maybe give something up, uh, replace it with something else. And then usually when you get some success, um, that usually fuels more good yes. behavior. So that, that's 
I mean, I think it's really important. You have to manage, it. you know, lab values are about what you eat in your dialysis treatments. And so most of that management is in your control, and you just have to take control of that. Well, you have you, to take charge. You, you have to. I mean, at the end of the day, your healthcare team cares about you. Uh, they're worried about your lab values. They want to help you. But at, at the end of the day, they're really about you and how well you're going to do. Um, so nobody should care as much as you should care. <laughs> Um, right. I mean, I, I think that's so important because um, it, it's, uh, I just like to circle back, you know, dialysis is hard, all the changes and all the different things you have to make, but it is doable. I mean, I was on dialysis 13 years and and I just talked to a patient who's been on dialysis 40 years. So, um, you know, you can do this. It just takes um, a little bit of extra extra work and, and finding the right tools and motivation to follow through. Right. And just be sure your care team is helping you. Don't let them just hand you a list of foods that you're not supposed to eat. Help them look at your diet with you or help them, you know, get them to help you manage your disease. It's you that are managing it. They need to help you do it. And they need to do it in the context of your day-to-day life. Um, so just ask for that. Um, hopefully they're, gonna, they're doing that, but ask for that help. Like, what can I do? Um, you know, I work full-time and I eat fast foods because I don't have time. Which ones, you know, where can I go? What can I eat? Help me with, with um, a recipe, you know, help me with fast foods that I can have ready to eat. So ask them to help you with the things that will help you with, with your day-to-day approach to uh, managing your, your and, disease. Yeah. And I don't know about you, Tricia, but I have been driving down the street starving to death. And I can't figure out where to eat. And there's like 10 places in front of me. I can't make a good decision. So you have to plan ahead of time. That's yeah. for sure. You know, yeah, it's and we used so to have important. patients bring in the... Um, what was on the menu so that we, you know, I have some teenage patients who went out with their friends, but they would, I would tell them, bring the menu in that you're where you're going and we can direct you on what to order so that when you get there, you won't have any confusion. You'll know exactly what you need to do. Take an extra binder for that meal, you know? And so there's a ways, ways to be prepared when you're in situations so that you can do your best. Well, and, you know, RSN has online support groups where you can come to Zoom meetings. And, you know, this topic comes up all the time. And yeah. it's a great way to seek other patients, find out what they're doing. Um, it, it can really be helpful to change some of those lifestyle aspects when you hear from other people who've made the change and, and uh, you know, it, you feel supported. And, you know, I always say one friend can make a difference. So for those of you listening, um, you know, try to find that person that you can kind of champion kidney disease together with (laughs) it it helps a lot right Lori. some of my most successful stories were connecting patients together that were helping each other and they stayed lifelong friends so so you're you're so right on with that so true i met um when i was in my teens i was getting a blood transfusion and i just had you know a had a second transplant that didn't work and just I met a girl during a blood transfusion was a few years older than me and a little bit cooler and I thought she knew a lot about (laughs) life and you know it it was just what I needed at the time and we became friends and it it really helped me understand how to grow up and and handle my illness so um you know uh, it's important to find somebody you connect with and you have something else in common with. You can't just have kidney disease. So, uh, um, you know, maybe there's somebody who's doing a craft project or something and you're into arts and crafts. And, um, you know, those friendships can be life-saving. And they can be cheaper than a therapist. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's really good. Having a friend. Well, thank you, Tricia, so much for your knowledge and dedication. Um, you have been in this this field for over forty years, which I, I don't know. You sound super young. I met, I bet you if a telemarketer <laughs> calls them, you could say, "My mom will get back to you." <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you um, in the future. 
Yeah, and Lori, thanks for all you do for all all kidney patients everywhere. Appreciate it. It's it's really been my life's work. I mean, I'm so privileged to be able to to meet so many of my peers and help them. And, you know, they help me too. So it's a win-win. Yeah, and I feel pretty privileged myself to have been in this for 44 years because I've been helped by a lot of patients also. So it's a two-way street. Yes, it is. Uh, we're here for life, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network. Please make sure to find us on Facebook or sign up for our newsletter at rsnhope.org. Kidney Talk is intended for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment from your physician. Always seek the advice of your own health care provider regarding your medical condition.